There we go. We started recording. All righty. So um, our presenter today is Dr. Shandra Shek Aran. I think I paused too much there, but I think I got it very close. <laughs> he received his medical degree from Kanul Medical School in Adira Pradesh, India. He completed a residency in internal medicine at St. Francis Hospital in Evanston, Illinois in 2003. He completed a critical care medicine fellowship training at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota in 2012, followed by a pulmonary disease fellowship with a particular focus on lung transplantation at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida in 2014. Dr. Chandra Shekharan was a trans lung transplant facility faculty at the University of Florida Lung Transplant Program from 2014 to 2021 where he served as the Lung Transplant Fellowship Program Director from 2017 to 2021. Um, yeah. And he was very closely involved in the training and mentor mentoring of multiple lung transplant and pulmonary fellows in this challenging field. He is board certified in internal medicine, critical care medicine, and pulmonary disease. Dr. Shandra Shek Aran, joined Emory in September of 2021 and his clinical interests in the management of patients with end-stage lung diseases. He specializes in the medical management of lung transplant candidates before and after transplantation. He is a proficient in ICU care of patients on ECMO machines pre and post lung transplant. And he also performs bronchoscopy and transbronchobiopsy on the lung transplant patients. He's a steering committee member for International Multicenter Registry of Intracorporeal Life Support and Lung Transplantation. And he's also on the steering committee of the American College of Chest Physicians Transplant Network. He's been invited as a speaker in international meetings for the American College of Chest Physicians. And he is constantly working on strategies to expand the donor pool. And his eventual goal is to ensure that every patient in needs of an organ receives it. I present to you Dr. Chandra Shekharan, and we thank him very much for being here with us this morning. Thank you very much, Ms. Patterson. Good morning, can you, can you all hear me okay? Okay, so let me see if uh, I can share my screen. Are you able to see my screen? Are you able to see my screen? Are you good? Okay, great. So uh, good morning. Good morning, everybody. I'm Satish Chandrasekharan. I'm a transplant pulmonologist at Emory. I recently moved to Emory. Prior to that, I was at the University of Florida. And uh, I think uh, what I'm tasked with today is talk about trends in lung transplantation, things that excite us and have happened in the last year or two and are making an impact on uh, patients' lives. Uh, so. I have no conflicts of interest. I'm not trying to promote any of these uh, products. Uh, uh, my job today is to talk about three topics because I thought I'd have 30, 40 minutes. I'll just talk about three topics. I'll give ample opportunity for you to ask any questions so that we can have a nice discussion. So uh, I'm not sure if earlier any of the speakers have touched on these, but I think we have some exciting news on donor-derived cell-free DNA. We have some... Uh, uh, use of baladacept in lung transplantation. And of course, my favorite topic is uh, how do we increase the donor pool so that we don't want any patients to die on the waiting list. And uh, I'll get started with donor-derived cell-free DNA. So uh, this science uh, comes from maternal and fetal medicine. We knew about this uh, 10 years ago, like prior to this, like in order to find out any of the abnormalities, chromosomal abnormalities in the fetus, we used to do amniocentesis, where we used to put a needle into the amniotic cavity, get a small amount of fluid, and we used to look up at the chromosomes of the unborn child to find out any of the chromosomal abnormalities. But then in 2008, uh, at Stanford University, they came up with this uh, technology where you could take a sample of the mother's blood instead of doing an amniocentesis, which was more invasive. And just from the mother's blood, they could define and differentiate the DNA of the unborn child and find out if there are any abnormalities. This science got better in 2012. 
So we knew about this for about 10 years, but in the last two years, there's been some excitement when this was applied to organ recipient, where we started looking at it in lung, the, in heart, lung, kidney transplantation. So just uh, a kind of brief background, what is a cell-free DNA? Uh, cell-free DNA refers to the DNA that is released into the blood once the cells die. Like all cells are programmed to have a death at some point. So when they die, they release some amount of DNA into the circulation. And then these are all small fragments of the DNA and they have a very short half-life of about 16 minutes. And uh, they're excreted in the urine, the kidney function is good. And they're also processed by the white cells in the liver and the spleen. So uh, levels of these cell-free DNA increase in uh, tissue injury. If there is a tissue injury, injury could be from anything. It could be from say in a lung transplant recipient, the injury could be uh, a rejection. It could be pneumonia. It could be aspiration, any, any kind of injury to the tissue where you, in, you know, it causes stress on the tissue would cause some of these cells to die and release the cell-free DNA. So transplantation creates an unusual scenario, just like the mother and child, the unborn child, maternal, fetal situation. In transplant recipient, you have the lungs of the donor, but the recipient's DNA structure is essentially different from the donor's DNA structure. And uh, with the science and the technology advancements that we have today, we are able to differentiate the DNA of the recipient from that of the donor and then find out if there is any injury to the donor lungs. Basically, this is what is a, a pictorial uh, representation of this. Uh, you have uh, the... Uh, donor lungs here, you have the recipient, the bloodstream of the recipient. You could see the two kinds of free DNA in the blood. One of them is coming from the donor lungs. One of them is coming from the recipient. And with the existing uh, science and technology and there were different techniques, we are able to isolate, differentiate one donor's DNA from the recipient's DNA and we can actually find out the percentage amount of this donor DNA compared to the recipient cell-free DNA. And this percentage fluctuates during the course of the post-transplant life of a recipient. If the lung is in distress, there is more of these DNA noticed rather than when the donor, I mean, when the recipient is doing well without any infection or rejection. So as we talk about, so there's donor-derived cell-free DNA, what we call as DDCF DNA that is represented here. The amount increases in any kind of rejection, whether it's cellular rejection, the most common type, or an antibody-mediated rejection, which happens in a lung transplant recipient. This test is very sensitive and has got very low specificity. It's very sensitive and specificities, it cannot differentiate if this is from an infection or rejection of the transplanted lungs. So unfortunately in lung transplantation compared to other transplantations, we have this chronic rejection that sets in, that kind of sneaks in, I should say. So many patients, majority of the patients will have some form of chronic rejection years after transplantation. And some patients develop it at a much more rapid rate compared to the others. So unfortunately, we don't have at this point to differentiate or to find out who are those patients that are going to develop chronic rejection faster than the others. So CLAD, or what we refer to as the chronic rejection, sets in all the lung transplantation that we do. But the only thing is the rate of onset of CLAD differentiate is different in each patient. So when we compare, so when we actually compare the lung transplant recipient survival with the other transplant recipients, whether it be it liver, heart, or kidney, we see that the survival of the lung is worse compared to the kidney, heart, and liver. And there's a reason for this. 
The transplanted liver, the transplanted heart, and the transplanted kidney sit in a very, they sit in a very safe cavity. They're protected from the environment. The only thing that goes into these organs that are transplanted is the blood. Unfortunately, the transplanted lungs are constantly exposed to the environment, and the risk of viral infections is very common. So every time you have a viral infection post-transplant, it actually causes a decrease in the graft function. So the exposure to the environment is what causes this risk factors in the lung. But unfortunately, we don't have anything to predict as to which patients are going to develop this chronic rejection faster than the others. And then this tool that has come into being, the cell-free DNA in the last two years, seems to have some promise. So I'm just briefly going to talk about one of the studies that came out in 2019, just uh, over a year ago. Like This was funded by the National Institute of Health. So there were 106 patients, uh, and this 106 patients were actually lung transplant recipients. And uh, after transplant, they were very closely monitored for uh, chronic rejection and uh, respiratory failure. The only thing that they did was they looked at the plasma levels of the cell-free DNA in the first three months in this 106 patients. So every patient would have a blood sample every month for the first three months after transplant. And then they would differentiate the donor-derived cell-free DNA from the recipient. They would calculate how high this donor-derived cell-free DNA is. That is, they would do an average and the percentage of this donor-derived cell-free DNA. And the technique that they used was a shotgun sequencing technique. So each individual's average was different from the other. So 106 patients had different average levels over the three months. And the average levels of this cell-free DNA was used to calculate the uh, graft failure using Cox regression model. And all the patients were monitored for chronic rejection or death. And then, so what they found was patients with high average donor derived DNA had almost like six to seven times higher chance of developing chronic rejection than those patients with low average DNA. Basically what they did was in the 106 patients, every patient would have a blood sample every month for the first three months after transplant. And depending upon what the number is, they actually divided the entire 106 patients into three groups, a group with the lowest amount of cell-free DNA, a group with an intermediate group, and a group with a very high amount of cell-free DNA. So interestingly, the group that had the very high cell-free DNA had a very high risk of developing chronic rejection. They developed a faster chronic rejection. They actually had lower lung function after transplantation. And this cohort, the, uh, the group of patients with a very high average cell-free DNA, about two thirds of them were asymptomatic to begin with, but then all of a sudden they would develop the chronic rejection. Only one third of this group had some clinical features that would help the clinician to say, hey, let's go ahead and do a bronchoscopy, biopsy, or do something. So this was a, it kind of, this tool was able to tell us that there is a group of patients who have a silent chronic rejection that is happening that could not be detected by our traditional uh, methods. So this study showed that average DNA of the donor in the blood was a potential predictive biomarker. It would help us to risk stratify the patients and probably look at this patients closer and probably do other immunosuppression techniques or something else to make sure that they don't go into rejection. So just to kind of give you an idea, so all the entire group was divided into lower tertile, that is with the low cell-free DNA of the donor, middle group and the upper group. The upper group is the one that had the higher chance of having acute rejection and had a faster onset of the chronic rejection. And actually uh, the amount of time to chronic rejection was much lower in this group. So finally, the authors go on to conclude that a 1% increase in the average DNA would increase the risk of CLAD 
1.5 times. So even in the subjects who had a very high cell-free DNA, they were at least seven to eight times higher risk of developing chronic rejection. And they developed this chronic rejection much faster compared to the other two groups. So this is again a tool that, that gives us some lead time for us to look into other options so that we can prevent chronic rejection. And it also tells us that something, the graft or the lungs in a transplanted CP are unhappy in some ways. And we need to look for other risk factors. Is this infection? Is it acid reflux and silent aspiration? Something that we are missing and that we need to act. So uh, this is how they calculated the average DNA for every individual. That is, they would look at the plasma levels for the first three months. We can see the group was broken down into three groups, the low group, middle group, and the upper group. And uh, you can see the survival, that is the survival of these patients divided by the three groups. The group, the one of the black dots, you can see had the highest average donor-derived cell-free DNA. They did not do well at all compared to the other two groups. So even if you look at the lung function post-transplant, you can see the black line that was the group with the highest amount of donor-derived cell-free DNA. They did not achieve high lung function, but they declined much faster than the other two groups. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop here and uh, open this for any discussion or questions. At this time, feel free to enter any questions you have into the chat and I'll read them out for the doctor to answer for us. So I feel like this might be a potential tool that we could use in all the transplant centers for monitoring of the patients. The traditional tools have always been like you're looking at a lung function test. And if you have any question about rejection or infection, we had to do a bronchoscopy and a biopsy, which we still do. We still like at the majority of the centers, you have a protocol where we do a surveillance bronchoscopy and biopsy at one month mark after transplant, one month, three months, six months, nine months, 12, 16 months is what we, 18 months is what we do, uh, bronchoscopies and biopsies. And when we do these biopsies, we actually look under microscope and the pathologist will help us tell if there's any early rejection by the type of cells present in these uh, biopsies. That's what we have been traditionally doing for the last so many years. But I think this is an important tool where we don't have to do a bronchoscopy in the sense that I don't have to put a patient through sedation, bring the patient into the hospital. This is just a simple blood test, which can be clubbed with the other blood tests that we do for the uh, levels of the medication. So this could be done every month and a slight increase in a blip from the baseline would probably tell us, hey, there is something that we are missing and uh, the patient would still be asymptomatic and we have lead time to intervene to take care of the lungs. So if there's any, no questions, I'll move on to the next topic. So which is uh, Baladasab in lung transplant. So Baladasab, is a medication that is used for rejection. And all the data that we have so far comes from kidney transplant recipients. So the trade name or the commercial name is New Logics. And the New Logics, uh, it's actually an IV medication compared to the other oral medications of immunosuppression. Uh, this medication, the Baladacept, is given as an infusion, once a month infusion, and it provides uh, immunosuppression, very similar to the traditional drugs. So uh, just to give a brief background, so uh, this is uh, the cellular level, the microscopic level where the process of rejection starts. Let's just imagine this uh, darkened area that I put up in the slide is the uh, donor lung. So once the donor lung is inside the body, this is the APC or the antigen presenting cell is that of the recipient. It's also called the dendritic cells. So these are cells that act as the policemen in the blood. So they go and constantly keep looking for any foreign bodies. And once they see this donor organ, they actually take a piece of this microscopic piece, process it, and then they provide this information to a T cell or a white cell 
and this T cell becomes activated. And the activated T cell is the one that causes the rejection. Okay, so now we're gonna take another look, closer look. This is like an electron microscopic look at the process of our rejection. In the green area is the antigen presenting cell and in the blue area is a T lymphocyte. So there has to be three interactions between this antigen presenting cell and the lymphocyte to start the process of rejection for the T cells to be activated to cause rejection. And all three signals have to happen for the T cell to be activated. So, uh, okay, so uh, I think we have uh, Warrior 15 is requesting remote control of the screen. So, uh, so <clears throat> now these three signals, the first signal is where the antigen presenting cell from the, uh, the MHC complex, that is the protein from the donor is processed and presented to the T cell receptor at the CD3. And then the second signal is an interaction between a protein called CD1886 from the antigen presenting cell and CD28 at the T lymphocyte. And the third interaction is interleukin, one of the chemical mediators that binds to a receptor on CD25. So all three processes have to happen for the activation of the T lymphocytes. So uh, traditionally, like uh, the immunosuppression medications that we use uh, include the cyclosporin and the tacrolimus. So in fact, organ transplantation became a reality only 1980s after cyclosporin came into the market. Before cyclosporin, all the transplantation, whether it be any kind of organs, would be rejected because we didn't have any immunosuppression. So this was a game changer. Cyclosporin was a game changer. And more recently, in the last 10 years, we have a better medication than cyclosporin called the tacrolimus. And this is where the cyclosporin and the tacrolimus, which belong to the family of calcineurin, they act and prevent uh, rejection. So that is the signal one. And uh, we have CELCEPT, also called as mycophenolate or CELCEPT, and imuran as a print. This is where they act to prevent rejection at the cellular level. And we have steroids that act here. So they kind of prevent the signal one, two, and three from happening. But the problem with long-term use of calcineurin or cyclosporin, say five, six years of everyday use of cyclosporin or tacrolimus leads to like hypertension, hyperlipidemia, high blood sugars. And the most problematic is the kidney problem or nephrotoxicity. So Actually, this is one of the papers that looked at how often does this happen. You can see that renal dysfunction or the kidney problem in one year after a group of lung transplant patients use tacrolimus, we see 25%, one in four of the lung transplant recipients will develop some kidney problem by one year. By five years, nearly 62% of the lung transplant recipients will develop some kidney problem because of the constant cyclosporin and the tacrolimus use, which are pretty hard on the kidneys. Now, do we have any other options? So this comes, this new medication called Belatacept. So Belatacept is like a development of science where we have, this is an, basically an antibody. It's called a fusion protein. Part of it is human monoclonal antibody and part of it is a fusion protein. And this protein, when injected as an infusion into the lung transplant recipient after lung transplantation, it goes and sits between the CD80 and 86 and prevents the interaction with CD28. This is the signal too that it blocks. Once it blocks, the T cells are not activated and there is no rejection. So this is very good when it looks in paper and science, but we don't know what happens when we really it applies when the rubber meets the road. Does it truly help the patient or does it cause harm? We don't know. So, so far all the studies have been in kidney transplant recipients and we do not have any signs or literature in lung transplant patients. So it has been used in all kidney transplant recipients. It's a T cell co-stimulation blocker, no data in lung transplant recipient. The previous institute where I was working, we actually did a research on our transplant recipients uh, 
who agreed to take this medication. So basically, uh, this is an IRB approved study where we were looking at whether use of belatacept in lung transplant recipients, does it improve renal function? But while we're thinking about the kidneys, are we worried that they also cause rejection? Does it mean that if you use belatacept uh, with a little bit of program for tacrolimus and try to protect the kidneys, are the lungs going to go into rejection? We don't know because we, all the studies so far have been very small scale studies. So we did this study at the University of Florida where I was previously, and this was an IRB approved study. So the, we had 85 patients who had taken belatacept in that institute after lung transplantation. These 85 patients were patients who not only had lung transplants and were taking the cyclosporin or the tacrolimus, but over time they had developed kidney problems. So we were kind of worried that further continuous use of tacrolimus would have them lose their kidney function and they may have to go on dialysis. So instead we used this medication called Belarasat, which they would come into the infusion center once a month, get this infusion, and they were maintained on a lower dose of program than normally what we would do. So there were 85 patients, the median age was 63, 53% of them were women. And the main diagnosis for which these patients underwent lung transplantation was fibrotic lung disease. About 28% also had COPD and the remaining patients had a breakdown of all these lung conditions that I mentioned. So in these patients, CMV status, always we look at a CMV status of a donor and a recipient. So majority of them, 47%, both the donor and recipient had seen CMV infection at some point before transplantation. However, like we had 22% of the patients where the donors had seen CMV before, but the recipients have not mounted an immune response before transplantation. This drug is not approved for an EBV mismatch, which means that if the donor is EBV positive, and the recipient is EBV negative, this drug is not approved. So I cannot have pharmacy will not approve to give this medication. So creatinine at the time of listing of this 85 patients, when they underwent transplantation, their creatinine was 0.78, which means that they had very good kidney function at the time of transplantation. If you look at their GFR, this is glomerular filtration rate or a measure of the kidney function, about 60% had great kidney function, 36 had some slight decrease in kidney function, only about four patients had kidney function in the range of 59 to 45, what we call as the stage 3A. Majority underwent bilateral lung transplant. So when they develop the kidney failure or kidney of uh, dysfunction, we started them on Belatacept. So about 75 patients, that is 88% were on tacrolimus, 10 were on cyclosporin. In addition to tacrolimus, they're also taking Celcept in Iran. And uh, how far out of transplant did we start this medication? Almost a year, like when you look at the median time, it was almost a year after transplant, that's when we started this medication. And what we looked was like, we looked at what is the risk of infection before we started this medication? What is the risk of infection and cancer after we started this medication? Because we have to be careful. Before we say that, hey, this is a great medication, we have to check and make sure that none of our patients are getting into trouble with these medications. So uh, creatinine function, that is kidney function right before palatacept, you can see there's 1.55. If you remember, in the previous slide I showed you the kidney function was great at the time of listing or transplant, 0.78. It almost doubled by the time we started with Belarusset. So they, there were like two patients on dialysis. There were patients who had kidney stage four kidney function, about 12%. And, all, and you can see that about 37 patients had kidney dysfunction in the stage 3B. So what were the results of our study? So this was the GFR. This is the blue is before the belatacept, that is, and then the red is after the belatacept was started and the fall of time. So the kidney functions did not get any worse. They did not improve statistically, but the good thing is they remained stable. None of them got worse. That is one important thing. And the FEV1 did improve a little bit. The FEV1, the lung function, what it tells me is that if I do belatacept, and a lower dose of program, 
the lungs are not going to be rejected. So that is the most important thing I can gain from this study. So what we concluded was, the latter step use did not show a decline in graft function. That is, patients are not rejecting their lungs because of this new immunosuppression strategy. And in our cohort, the latter step use did not show a statistically significant improvement in the GFR. And there's a tendency towards a higher opportunistic infection. So there's a tendency towards infection. So we have to be very cautious. So what this study has provided us with an information that there's a select group of patients whose kidney function is getting worse with the traditional um, you know, to prograph and uh, cyclosporin, we can introduce belatacept with a lower dose of prograph provided that they are not a CMV mismatch, they're not an EBV mismatch, they don't have a lot of infections in the past. So there's a, there is a role for this drug, but cautiously, I think, yes, there is some good news. So I'm gonna stop here. Or any questions that I can answer. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to type it into the chat box. I'll read it off and the doctor will answer us. And uh, we submitted this as an abstract to the International Society of Heart Lung Transplantation and we're working on the manuscript and then we plan to submit it uh, to the journal very soon. So we do have uh, some good news uh, for, I wouldn't say that all patients' kidney function can be saved, but yes, in a select group of patients, I think there's a role for this medication. And as I mentioned, so far, all the big trials and studies have been in kidney transplant recipient. And this is the only large study of 85 patients that we saw. And I think uh, the patients, the good news is like the patients are not rejecting their lungs with this medication and the kidney function doesn't get statistically any better, but it doesn't get any worse. So we can at least have the patients maintain that kidney function with this medication. Wonderful. All right, any questions, ladies and gentlemen? Uh, we have a question from Sharon. Is, yes. em is Emory routinely doing this transplant at this time? Is Emory routinely doing lung transplant at this time? Yes, I think that's the question. Correct. Yes, we are doing lung transplants at this point. So uh, this is a very good question. I think uh, there are several aspects to oh. the question. Can I? Yeah. Sorry, she meant this treatment. Sorry. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, we have gradually used this, this one more tool in our toolbox. And we are selecting the patients who we can give this medication. So uh, the advantage at Emory here is like our clinic is very closely associated with an infusion center. In fact, when you come to our clinic, there's actually an infusion center attached to the clinic. So patients don't get admitted. They just come to the clinic, they have a clinic visit, and then they go to the infusion center and get this IV medication, which is once a month. So it's a once a month IV infusion. And uh, as I mentioned, we make sure that they haven't had, some lung transplant patients have lots of infection burden that is, and some patients don't. So we make sure there's no infection that we are missing. We make sure that they were not an EBV mismatch because there has been a theoretical risk of lymphoma in these patients. And we make sure they don't have a CMV mismatch situation where the donor had seeing the CMV and the recipient had not seen the CMV. If these things, all these checkboxes are there, yes, we can provide this medication. Ready? Are there any other questions? Uh, if you'd like to go ahead and answer the first question I'd asked about the uh, whether they were still doing transplants, because I know there's a lot of confusion sometimes with what's going on with the coronavirus. Yes, absolutely. Let me ask the question. Hospitals are transplanting. Correct. So the last two years, you know, have been kind of many things have changed, 2020 and 21. So, uh, you know, uh, all the transplant centers, there are 60 adult lung transplant centers in the country have been rather slow because of uh, COVID. But we have learned a lot during this period. So we have learned that we need to vaccinate our transplant recipients. We have learned that routine vaccination, in addition, we need to give them booster doses to keep their immunity higher. 
we have learned how to screen our donors very closely. Like we have developed better techniques to screen the donors to make sure that we don't bring COVID to the recipient at the time of transplantation. We have learned how we can protect our procurement teams from going in to get the uh, uh, organs. So all these have gotten better. We have definitely learned a lot in the last year. And so lots of the centers are started to transplant cautiously because we cannot have our patients wait on the list because some of these patients cannot make it that long. So that is the reason I think all of our centers have started to transplant more and more in the last couple of months. Prior to that, it's been pretty slow across the board in all the transplant centers. Previously, we were doing majority of the visits were telemedicine visits. We have learned a lot from that. And then now we're doing a hybrid of telemedicine and in-clinic visit. So I could tell you a year ago, all my clinic visits were telemedicine. I would sit right like this in front of a computer. I would have a patient uh, see the patient at their home and then they would do their lung function right in front of me with their handheld device, give me the numbers. And we had teams that would go to the patient's home and do blood draw and then look at the drug levels. But now that we have the vaccine, we have vaccinated all our transplant recipients and then they have a better call, at least they're able to get out of home. And then now we have all these uh, uh, places where we do the lab test, the lab core and the quest, they all have like appointments that you could make with all the softwares, you know, the handheld devices, the smartphones where you can go in. So it's less crowded. So it's the safety. We have learned a lot from this. So patients do come to the clinic. I see patients in the clinic and we are doing blood tests and things are getting better. And then we also had treatments like at this point, like um, I urge uh, some of my patients, I get a call saying, hey, it looks like I have developed infection, the COVID infection. It's very difficult to protect patients because, you know, if you go out in the community, family members, friends, and social gatherings, yes, these things happen. Like we have sent our patients to the emergency room much earlier. We have had contact with the emergency room so that we can do as a special request as a IV immunoglobulin, the Regeneron for these patients to protect them. And they have done very well. So we want to give them as a special circumstance to protect our patients compared to the general population. Yes, we have done all these things. And I think we have learned a lot and things are improving and we are transplanting. Wonderful, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, another aspect of the question is, we have also transplanted for patients who develop lung fibrosis from the COVID-19 disease. There are some patients who developed an infection earlier in the pandemic, but then they had continued progression of pulmonary fibrosis. And uh, these patients, if they are strong enough and have a good family backup, we have transplanted them and we are transplanting them too. Because if months later, the lung function is not improving, we don't see a pathway for these patients. Thank you, thank you very much. Were there any more questions or should we move on to the next portion? I think we have five minutes. I'm gonna like stop here and I'll just open it up for any questions you have. Like it could be related to the topics that I discussed or it could be anything that you would like to ask. Please do that so that, you know, uh, uh, I think this will be better spent time talking to you. Wonderful. So we'll open up the floor for the uh, for questions. Just enter them into the chat and I'll read them off just as I did before. And any question for an to a lung transplant would be, please. All righty. Um, while they're uh, deciding on how to, how to ask their question or type it in, uh, I did want to state that we do allow the Bella infusion uh, at full reimbursement uh, through your, if you have a TFP account, a TFP matched account, 
uh, we don't nickel and dime you and make you pay for the medicine on one hand and the infusion therapy counts under your thousand dollar cap or anything like that. We do fully uh, reimburse for it or pay it to Emory for it. Thank you very much, Ms. Patterson, for that. Yep. No problem. Any questions? All right, uh, Sharon again. Does in, does Emory think there will be an increase in patients that have COVID and could get from fibrosis in the future? Yes, a uh, very good question. Like, uh, so the question is, do we think that there is going to be an increase in the number of patients presenting into the lung transplant centers with pulmonary fibrosis from COVID? So we are learning more and more about this disease. So what we know so far compared to the last uh, year or so is the two kinds of disease that uh, can occur from COVID infection. One is like the Im imminent, very respiratory failure, intense pneumonia, what we call it the ARDS that lands the patient in the ICU on ventilator and then eventually the breathing requirements cannot be met by the ventilator. They have to go on an ECMO machine or extracorporeal membrane oxygenator or what we refer to as the artificial lung machine where your blood circulates into this machine and this machine basically does the function of the lungs by adding oxygen and removing carbon dioxide. So a group of these patients land on ECMO their lungs get better and then they're able to go home. But there's also a group where the lungs don't get any better. They just intensely like during that initial hospitalization fibros and they're not able to get off the ECMO machine. And these are patients who might need a transplant how, or otherwise they don't have an option. Now, there's a second group of patients who have COVID disease, who probably get either admitted to the ICU or to the floor, and then the lung function improves that they can get discharged from the hospital. But unfortunately, they develop some pulmonary fibrosis. And you know, the over time, this fibrosis might get further worse. So we have not seen that group of patients as yet, but what I worry is, that probably in the next year or two, we might start seeing these patients whose pulmonary fibrosis after the COVID did not get completely better that they could go back to the normal lives. So that might be an issue that we might see in the future. So the answer to the question is yes, we have learned a lot about this disease and we're continuously learning about this disease. And we have two groups of these patients at this point, we're dealing with the first group of patients, patients who land up in the ICU, are unable to come off the ventilator or artificial lung machine, and I need a transplant. But I worry that we will start seeing a greater proportion of the second group who developed some pulmonary fibrosis are able to leave the ICU on the floor and go home on some oxygen, but the lung fibrosis is not getting any better that they're not able to go back to a normal life. I hope I answered your question. Thank you so much, Sharon. Does anyone have any, else have any questions? Uh, can family members be tested for the possibility of ILD at what age and familial history? And this is also from Sharon. Sharon, very good question. This is a big uh, uh, topic of debate in all the meetings. You know, uh, uh, your question is very good. So I just have to provide a brief background. I think, let me first repeat the question and please correct me if I'm wrong. So what you asked is, can family members be tested for pulmonary fibrosis at what age, right? Am I right in saying that? So what we have, Learning at this point is like, there's a group of uh, patients with pulmonary fibrosis called as IPF or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Idiopathic meaning we don't know the reason why their lungs are going into pulmonary fibrosis. So in this group of patients, actually there is a genetic component that we are learning more and more. 
And actually a subgroup of this up to 25% have something called as the shot telomer syndrome, which basically means that they have genetic mutations as a result of which the chromosomes are getting shorter and shorter much faster. As we all age, like our chromosome length probably is maximum at age 18, 19, but the chromosome length start decreasing after that. But it's a very slow rate, but there are some patients who have a telomer defect, which means the caps, the end caps of the chromosome are not functioning correctly to protect the chromosome and these chromosomes get shorter very quickly compared to the general population. And these also happen to be the patients whose lungs go into fibrosis much faster than the others. And these also happen to be the group of patients who have a genetic component because with the advances in science, we are able to detect certain mutations called, and these mutations, I think if I remember, TRT mutation, TREC mutation, so these are the mutations that actually go from as a genetic component in the genetic pool. So, but the tough part is like, uh, you know, I have to be very cautious as to what I tell you about it. Should the family members should be? So let me answer the first question. Yes, there is a genetic component to the IPF, okay? But uh, would I test my family members if one of my family members has pulmonary fibrosis? I would probably not because there are more, you know, I don't want any of these family members to get into insurance issues at this point. So we need a better mandate on how the insurance is done before we start testing our family members because there are much more implications to testing family members because I don't have any treatment to give you, Sharon, or any of your family member if I detect that to prevent a pulmonary fibrosis, okay? So to protect you and to have better, you know, this is, a, this is a very big question you're asking. And yes, I don't have uh, the answer to that question. So this is not the first time I've been asked this question. I have several patients who have short telomer syndrome with IPF, post-transplant, and they've asked me, should I have my kids tested? And I said, I don't have the answer to that question. If I were you, I would not do that, is what I would say unless and until I find a medication that I can give you in lead time to protect your loved one from pulmonary fibrosis. Did I answer your question, Sharon? All righty, uh, thank you so much. Was there anyone else who had a question? Or? Alrighty. Thank you very much. Well, it's been a, yeah. I was gonna say, we thank you very much for helping oh, no. us out and for talking with us today and giving us so much wonderful information. So it's been a pleasure. And as I said, uh, I would like to reach out uh, to you all uh, probably more, more often. And uh, please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions and I'll be very happy to answer them. Okay. So uh, always a pleasure. And I, I don't know, much about you, but I wish you all the best in your journey. And uh, I hope that uh, I, we can be part of the journey and help you out, okay? So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Well, this concludes our presentation. We will uh, make the video available on our YouTube page. And of course, it will go out to everyone later as well. Thank y'all very much for attending. And thank y'all very much for your wonderful question. Thank you, Ms. Patterson. I appreciate you. No problem. Alrighty. Thank you. I will hope everyone has a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you.